your next meeting. So you have to do this in a soundbite. But one of the questions I get, which we should always ask for anything when there's foreign assistance involved, is transparency and accountability. Let's just say Eastern Europe is not always known in the olden days for those two words, transparency and accountability, when it comes to big funding. How do we make sure that this large amount of funding going very quickly mm -hmm. is transparent and accountable and the money's going to where it needs to be? You managed to ask this question without putting the word corruption in it. Okay, corruption. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you said it. <laughs> But look, you know, yes, Ukraine had systemic corruption until 2013. That was one of the reasons why we actually said no to the pro-Russian or Russian-owned President Yanukovych. And we started, you know, uh, changing the, the path to European Union. With regard to transparency, like, first of all, uh, you know, you, as the Minister of Finance, I can tell you, our budget is a pretty primitive budget right now. We have cut down all the expenditures except for direct costs of the pain for our military and you know supporting the bare minimum that we can for the teachers uh, healthcare workers and helping our uh, employees there is no capital expenditures there is no areas where actually you know uh, you have to be like very attentive in order to see whether it's efficient or not with regard to the us support yes the 113 billion is a huge amount of money now out of this uh, approximately uh, 2022 billion is the direct budget support. This is what we get as money. Everything else, the security assistance, energy and everything else, we get as the equipment. So it's very well controlled. There is NATO system, log fast for the, for the uh, weapons equipment. We report on it. We share all the information and we're not buying it ourselves. So uh, there, there is, uh, you know, a trust in, the, in your system actually that is procuring or getting it from your stocks using the money that Congress so generously provided to us. With regard to the budget assistance, it goes from uh, USAID to the World Bank Trust Fund and then gets into Ukraine, and we report literally daily on it. Daily. You can trace uh, every dollar when the amount is received the tranche, when we convert it into Ukrainian currency, and then we report where it goes on the IDPs, for example. You can see even down to people who are receiving it, and our digitalization something that Ukraine is known for, allows actually to provide very detailed account on it. So, uh, look, you know, there uh, you have three inspectors generals who work on specifically case of Ukraine from Pentagon, from USAID, from state. They, you, they're working from here. Last January, they have been in Ukraine. Uh, they all put out a number already of documents out saying, from which it's clear, together with the statement from the Treasury, that there is no... Um, mismanagement or any concerns uh, or any um, uh, m m misuse of the, of the American assistance or for that matter any international assistance. Now, for us it's also important to have that with our own uh, money as well, the taxes that we are collecting in Ukraine because for, for example for our military expenditures none of the, uh, our uh, allies and partners is paying for it. It's only Ukrainian uh, revenues that goes to it. So, yes, you hear from time to time about a very high level arrest, and uh, we are not proud of it, but it's a sign, actually, that all the anti-corruption infrastructure working. Working. that we have created during the past seven years, the general prosecutor is actually working. And even during the war, they are not only investigating war crimes, not only investigating what Russians did, but they are doing a very good job in uh, looking at, at those who do not understand that during the times of war, and this is from the Ukrainian people, we view acts of corruption as a treason. When our soldiers are on the battlefield, yeah. are sacrificing their lives, you know, people will not tolerate those who use these times for mismanagement with the public funds. So not everything is ideal. But as our president says, you know, we don't have the zero corruption yet, but we have zero tolerance to corruption. And that will continue. So you can see why she is one of the most sought after people in this town, which is where I want to ask my last question. Um, I'm a big fan, as you can probably tell. <laughs> um, the ambassador, this is a personal question. Over the last year, I have seen you be an invited guest to sit next to the First Lady at the State of the Union. 
Um, you were a very sought after guest at the White House Correspondent Dinner. You threw out, you told me last night that the hardest thing you've done so far is you've had to throw out the first pitch at the opening night of the Nationals sure. game. <laughs> and you just gave your first commencement address at Boston College. Thank you. And it was brilliant. It was brilliant. And each one of those, though, is a very important part of literally saving lives because you are out there representing, just like you're sitting here today, telling the story of why. Why we need to be right here with you fighting for the bravery of Ukraine. But on a personal basis, how do you balance the demand of what you are doing with your, you have family, you have your mother, you have your family, you have your friends, at home in Ukraine, and you're out there doing all of these demands of you. You last night, I think you were on your third event when I saw you. How are you doing all of this? Well, the honest answer would be I don't know, <laughs> but of course that's not a good answer to give. Uh, so uh, look, you know, and, bring, and bringing hope when, to, to the fact that this is this is tough. When this phase of the war started on 24th of February. Uh, of course, there was war since 2014, but it was contained to, like in Crimea, in the eastern Ukraine, there was ceasefire, you know, and it, it, was, it was different. Uh, this actually, actually is the challenge you can never be prepared fully for. Uh, but, you know, when we look at our brave president, who literally leaves in his office since the war started, and he travels to places that... Uh, you know, every time we see him on the front line, I think even, even the enemy is uh, uh, surprised and shocked. When we see it, our brave defenders, I mean, they cannot say, sorry, I'm tired, you know, or I need, uh, I need a vacation, or, you know, they literally fight and uh, sacrifice everything. When we see the civilians right, right now, so many, just ordinary people rush and, and um, you know, uh, help people and relocate people and save these uh, dogs and kittens everywhere. Uh, how can we complain? Uh, yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's 24-7, but the bombs are not falling on me here. And, uh, uh, you know, this, this is something that we have to do because there is a goal to win. And we know the, that responsibility. And frankly, you know, like, you just do what you have to do as much as you can do it. Um, I think, you know, uh, I, you know, had a special guest today at the embassy, the chaplain of the House of Representatives, and we prayed together, and that's also a very important part of, of um, how, to, how to do it. You know, you, you pray and you find strength in that, because, you know, at the beginning of this war, a lot of people in Ukraine said, how could something like this happen, you know, and our faith is very important for us in Ukraine, and where is God, you know, but then you find... You, 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 you find it again. You find the strength. And, and it helps you to move ahead as long as, as you need to. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Ambassador Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. I still have to say. Yes. <laughs> I have to say, she gets to go. <laughs>